Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I hope you're having a beautiful day so far and in today's video I'm going to be sharing a time lapse for a watercolor landscape that I painted this week. And though I don't consider this to be a step-by-step -step tutorial, I am going to be mentioning a few kind of key aspects in my process and things that I have in my mind as I went through this painting. I hope you guys enjoy it and get something from this and let's get right to it. So for this one, I knew since the beginning that I wanted full freedom with designing the composition myself. And so what I did is I took some ideas from different landscape reference photos that I found online, such as these that I am showing you right now. And then once I had all of this kind of key visual information in my mind, I stepped away from the images and I just freely came up with my own landscape. And really something that I have found is that I really love, even when I am using only one reference picture for a landscape, I love using my artistic license and modifying things, taking away things that I feel are not adding to the composition and even bringing things in. Uh, modifying them, making things larger, making things smaller, modifying the color a little bit, etc. In the beginning of this video, you saw me finalizing my selected thumbnail in which I decided the placement of my different elements that I was going to be including. And I was also already starting to give thoughts at that point to my layering process. What layer or what section I was gonna be working on first, which areas I was gonna be working on second, and what I was gonna be leaving until the end. And I was also starting to give thought already to what areas of my landscape I wanted more definition in and which I wanted kind of blurred out and less detailed. This of course made me think of what I was going to be approaching wet on wet versus wet on dry. All of these things are absolutely essential for me to give thought to since before starting with the painting process and I explain why in past videos that I'm going to make sure to link to. And finally, another thing that I like giving thought to in the beginning is how I'm going to be creating contrast and variation throughout my painting. And this is also something that I have mentioned in the past, how it's very important to give thought to how you're going to be creating contrast and variation in your piece. Um, when it comes to watercolor, for example, I always like giving thought to what areas of my painting are going to be more transparent with lighter values and which areas are going to be less transparent and more saturated. I don't do this with every single landscape painting or painting in general, but I did want to bring in a bit of masking fluid for this one. I really wanted to add in some colorful flowers at the end and I really wanted to protect those light areas in order for me to be able to add bright, vivid pigment to them later on at the end of the painting process. So that's what you saw me do in the beginning of this video as I was masking out these little areas. I masked out these areas in a fast, loose, irregular way and this is something that I often like keeping in mind whenever I'm painting landscapes or anything natural for that matter. Things in nature are not perfect and they don't have any specific patterns or anything like that. So I really want to stay away from creating stark looking shapes or keeping a specific kind of line in my head because if I keep lines and things like that in my head, I'm going to then notice that I'm making something look too mechanical and too organized and this is not going to lead to that organic irregular feel that I'm going for. In nature, there are always a huge amount of variations in terms of height, in terms of width, in terms of shape, etc. and I really want to stay away from creating any specific patterns or anything like that. Alright, so once I have prepared all of these things, it's time to move on to the painting process. And when it comes to landscapes, as well as still lifes for the most part, I love working from the furthest layer, so the background, towards the front. Whenever I can though, because it is important to realize, especially when it comes to watercolor, that I have to allow certain areas to dry before going back in. And as I am doing this, I'm kind of jumping around once I get to that point. So for this painting, what I did initially was I wet my entire sky area using my one inch flat brush. 
And when it comes to starting to add pigment to these larger areas that I'm working wet on wet in, I really love dropping in my pigment by dancing around with my paintbrush, moving it in different angles and different directions. And this organically creates these cloud shapes. I stay away from really covering the entire area with pigments and I deliberately make sure that I allow some sections of my paper to shine through completely. When it comes to skies and creating those cloud effects, I also love using regular kitchen paper towels to lift some pigments up at the end and further define those cloud shapes here and there. After I finished my sky, it was time to allow it to dry completely because I didn't want the furthest tree line to blur into my sky. And so I had to allow that layer to dry completely before painting in those trees. Now when it comes to landscapes, a technique that I really love using in order to further transmit that sensation of space and depth and perspective is to make elements that are further away from the viewer cooler based. So add a little bit of blue to them and elements in the foreground to be warmer based or have more yellow in them. Usually you can create a sense of depth by making further away elements cooler based hazier and more muted out than the elements in the foreground. You can also add more definition to the elements in the foreground to make them appear closer to the viewer. Of course, you can decide which techniques you want to use for your own artwork depending on the subject that you're painting and the effects that you're personally going for. For example, when it came time to painting that tree line in the background, I wanted to make sure that that green had a lot of blue in it so I used a viridian green, which is already a green that has blue in it, and I even created variations of that green by adding a little bit more Prussian blue. And then, when it came time to creating my greens for the middle ground and the foreground, I used my same viridian green, but I added a lot of yellow to it. For my yellow in this case, I used gamboge, which is a beautiful, super bright, vivid yellow. As I was painting in these trees in the faraway distance, as well as this tree in the middle ground, I had in my mind the general shape of these kinds of trees, which is kind of an irregular triangle. But I always had irregularity in mind in terms of height, in terms of width, in terms of values. And I even went in after my paint had dried in order to do a little bit of lifting to further enhance the transparency and dimension in some areas. And then it was time to move on to starting with the initial layers of paint in the middle ground and in the foreground. For all of these other areas, I didn't really pre-wet my paper with clean water or anything. I just went in with pigment right away. However, I did start with a very light, translucent value and then started adding my darker values on top as the initial layers of paint were still wet. And again, to paint these larger areas, I like switching back to my one inch flat brush and dancing with my paintbrush, filling the area in in a very organic, irregular way and allowing the paintbrush and the paint to kind of do their own thing. And while I already have a good idea of where my highlights and lightest areas are going to be, I kind of allow the paint and the paintbrush to dictate where some of the areas of highlights and those sections of pure white paper showing through are going to be. And then I do my best to keep these areas protected, at least for the most part, as I am starting to lay down those darker values. Along with the greens, I also made sure to start adding in some neutral brownish tones to start visualizing where my ground or my dirt or soil around this lake area were going to be located. Once these initial values of lightest greens and browns were laid down, it was time to start in with the green mid-tones. And this is where I very freely went into all of the areas that I wanted to include a darker green in, including this tree in the middle ground, and started working on that. I continued developing those deeper, darker green values all throughout this middle ground and foreground area and even started adding in those grass effects using my 4-inch round brush. 
As I am painting my grass, I also have in mind that I want a large variation in terms of transparencies, in terms of lightness to darkness, and even in terms of the directions that the blades of grass are curving in or bending towards. When it comes to blades of grass and also flowers, it's also very important to have in mind that the elements that are farthest away in the distance should be way smaller than the elements that are closest to us. When it came time to work on the water section of this landscape, I switched back to my one inch flat brush and went in to start developing those lightest versions of blue. I made sure to leave some sections of this area completely white so that I could really create the effect of water and the reflective qualities of water and ripples of water. And while this lighter blue paint was still wet, I went in to drop in some middle blues and some darker blues. And I don't think I did much to the water section after that. I then switched back to my brownish dirt areas and darkened some values there. And as I move forward, adding in darker values in all of this green section in the middle ground and foreground, most of this area is already dry by this point and so these darker values that I'm laying down, as you can see, they're not blurring out as much as the initial layers did. And this is great because I can lay down more defined shapes, more defined edges, which is great because this helps me create the illusion of rocks, and this also helps me continue working on the blades of grass. I continue working on the transitions from the blues of the water to the browns and from the neutral browns to the greens, etc. until I'm happy with how it looks and I allow the painting to dry completely until it's at a bone dry state. I then move on to removing the masking fluid with my hands and with my thumb very gently. I know that a lot of artists are against using your hand to remove the masking fluid because the oils of your hand can transfer onto your painting and your paper. However, my hands are always incredibly dry and I've honestly never really had a problem with it, so I'm gonna continue until I do, I guess. So I continue removing my masking fluid as best as I can all throughout my painting. And then it was time to start painting in those flowers in some of these foreground sections that the masking fluid was blocking out. Now, I want to make sure that I have a variation in terms of transparencies and red values even within these flowers. And the point is not to completely fill in the entire little section that was blocked out or anything like that. I actually want to leave some of those whites shining through. So I continue developing those red values until they are at a point that I like them. And as you're gonna see, I even go into some green areas and drop in some red in there. This helps create the illusion of some flowers being further away from us or even some flowers being covered by blades of grass. Once I'm done with the flowers, I allow them to dry completely and add more grass here and there and just go back to see if I have to darken some green values, etc. If there's anything else that I want to kind of work on throughout the entire middle section and foreground. All right, you guys, I am nearing the final stages of this landscape painting, and I want to send out a huge shout out and a humongous thank you to my Patreon community members. Thank you so much, Angie, Destiny, Frank, Ian, Jean, Jennifer, Lisa, Charlotte, and Shannon. You guys are absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for your support and for being part of my community. If you'd like to get access to my most exclusive content in the form of real-time drawing and painting tutorials, each with its own outline drawing, supply list, and reference picture, live classes on art fundamentals, live Q&As, and insights into my own creative projects that I don't share anywhere else, direct feedback from me on your arts, and much, much more, I would absolutely love to have you become part of my Patreon community. You can also get access to my closed Facebook group in which I am in several times each week by becoming an email subscriber, and I'm gonna make sure to leave a link to that down below. There are already over 600 amazingly talented and positive and encouraging helpful artists in my Facebook group, and I'd love for you to become part of it. I really feel that as an artist, being surrounded by like-minded, creative people is super important in order to stay consistent, 
Let me know what you do. If you have any friends locally that you hang out with and create art with, or if you mostly hang out with and get feedback from online art communities or Facebook groups, I'd love to know. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. Don't forget to leave me a like if you enjoyed this video because it really helps my channel get in front of more people. Do check out these watercolor videos that I have picked out for you if you haven't already and talk to you soon. Bye!